Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cosmic Echo, a Taylor podcast. I'm your host tonight, Lee Adams, and I'm joined with Ruman Nyman, who is a um, he is a researcher in sleep and dreams, and he spends most of his time um, helping clients with their sleep uh, behavior to improve their sleep, as well as overcome some of their experiences in, in dreaming and to incorporate those dreams into their life. Um, in this interview, we talk about dreams specifically and, and also sleep um, and how to improve our dream um, capacity and our willingness to listen to our dreams to overall improve our lives and to overcome uh, adversity and other things like that. Um, we also talk about sleep paralysis. We talk about um, uh, sleep hygiene, some sleep hygiene things. And also we talk about his newest project, which is um, incorporating communities into dream circles type of experiences where people can talk about their dreams and um, communicate to other people their dreams and people have a dialogue and creating some type of uh, community dialogue with dreams incorporated into it. And I think it's really a great thing. And uh, he has some great analogies on um, how to describe certain experiences in dreams, which I think is amazing. And um, it's just overall a great experience uh, talking with him. So without further ado, let's just get to the interview. It's great to have you on the show with, with me. And um just please introduce yourself and how you got involved in uh, your your research and sleep and um, how you started helping patients and stuff like that and, and and your involvement with dreams as well. Great. Well, well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Ruben Nyman. I'm a clinical psychologist and uh, a sleep and dream specialist um, for the last 20 years with the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, so I, I work there primarily in a medical school teaching physicians about sleep and dreams. And um, I've been involved in, in um, dream work ever since uh, I was about uh, oh, 16 or 17 when um, I had the um, mixed privilege of having a conversation with uh, Dr. Timothy Leary. Um, a friend and I um, contacted him and asked him a very basic question. We were listening to... Uh, a lot of the uh, sort of uh, spiritual existential music at the time and reading Zen. And I remember asking him, um, is, is this LSD thing like Zen? And he said, and this is a quote, he said, yeah, 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 take it. And, and we did. And um, as Michael Pollan describes in his recent book, How to Change Your Mind, uh, um, shortly after, after about 40 or 50 acid trips over the next couple of years, I felt like a snow globe, a giant snow globe that had been shaken vigorously. <laughs> and, uh, I stayed away from substances for quite some time, quite a long time, because I really needed this to settle. But I think like with many people, two things. One is the experiences themselves were self-limiting. And the last number of acid trips I had, I did them alone. I was at Rutgers University at the time. And... Um, I'd actually grab an empty beer can so the frat guys who were drunk on their asses wouldn't think I was weird and I could do whatever I wanted. But, but I, I would uh, walk around and make notes. And um, it led me to, um, uh, it brought me this experience that, you know, that there was a world behind the world. That it wasn't just an idea, but I felt it, I saw it. And um, the experiences are so profound. I mean, it's easy to dismiss them as drug-induced hallucinations, but uh, they stayed with me. And uh, as was the case for uh, um, a handful, a group of us who, who were friends back then and remain friends today, um, we all ended up in helping professions, most of us psychologists today. Um, and um, somehow it, it opened our hearts as well as our minds. It opened us to a sense of connection with others. So um, I spent the first 10 years of my work um, interested in dreaming and um, uh, its relationship to life, to death, uh, and to illness. Uh, I, I became very interested in death and dying, met and spent a lot of time with, worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, the death and dying lady, as she was called. And then um, 
consulted off and on with uh, with San Diego Hospice for almost a decade. Um, again, deepened my interest in dream work, um, precognitive dreaming, dreaming associated with illness, dreams and cancer became a strong interest of mine. Um, and dreams and healing, dreaming and grieving, dreaming. So after about a decade of that, I uh, was kind of burnt out. Um, I sold everything I owned, really. I bought a Volkswagen camper and trucked back to Tucson, where I had gone to school originally, and took a year off, which oh, was wow. great. But uh, ended up at a meditation meeting and met some interesting folks and got drawn into um, a facility in Tucson uh, called Canyon Ranch, uh, a world-renowned resort, um, and um, became their first sleep, sleep specialist. Oh. So back in the early 90s, uh, we opened a sleep center uh, at a resort, not at a hospital. I think it was the first one in the U.S., maybe the world, uh, in which we were able to look at sleep, not entirely as a clinical medical sort of disordered condition. Uh, Dr. Andrew Weil was there, and um, he strongly influenced the structure of you know, bringing in what is today called an integrated, what used to be called a holistic approach. So I began looking at sleep and dreams from this much broader perspective. Um, I had been trained previously uh, in, in sand tray or sand play therapy, which I still do, which is a kind of waking dream work. Mm. But most of my focus then shifted, uh, it shifted strongly into sleep disorders and sleep issues. And I've written extensively about that um, from a whole other perspective. And, I, and I'll, I'll say in short, I think one of the huge problems with sleep today, one of the uh, wholly unexamined reasons we have an epidemic of insomnia, of sleeplessness, is that sleep doctors frankly, don't give much of a shit. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I, mean, I, I don't mean to sound critical. I guess I am, though. But um, dreaming in REM sleep is looked at as a stepchild of sleep. It is sleep medicine. Uh, I frankly got into a dispute with Oxford University Press. I was, um, um, they'd asked me to do a book on integrative sleep medicine. And the title I proposed was Integrative Sleep and Dream Medicine. And the, these experts from around the world said, there's no such thing as dream medicine. Hmm. I responded by saying what we call medicine in the world today, you know, Western uh, allopathic medicine grew out of the Greek Asclepian tradition. And so, and w which was largely focused on dreaming, hmm. primarily focused on dreaming. So um, th there's a rift that, that I think needs to be healed. Uh, the bottom line is that we are at least as dream deprived as we are sleep deprived, um, in fact, so much of the, so many of the negative medical ramifications that we attribute to sleep loss turn out to be the effect of dream loss. So, so let me mention, I just, um, uh, within the last year, I published an article with the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences about what is my greatest clinical concern today. And, and the article is entitled Dreamless, the silent epidemic of REM sleep loss. And uh, there, there's a simple thesis that's supported by a lot of data. And that is that we, as a, in the US and the Western world and the developed world, we are dreaming less and less and less over time. And I think this gradual constriction or, or suppression of dreaming results in a constriction of consciousness. Yeah. I think in a very subtle way, the walls close in on us. We dream less. Um, you know, when we dream, uh, it's not just that. It's not just about the dream. Um, uh, the notion of dreaming, the act, the process of dreaming, is as important as, and maybe more important than the dream. Uh, I'm fond of saying more important than knowing what any particular dream means is knowing that dreaming is a meaningful process. Yeah. When we dream we perceive um, outside of our senses. It's basically, it's extrasensory perception. Dreams are ESP, because our eyes are closed, we're not listening, you know, we're, we're not using our touch senses, but we sense in an extrasensory way. So I, I call that, I refer to that as using dream eyes. Every time we dream, when we dream in that, we're exercising a, a way of perceiving, it's a way of seeing, it's a creative, expansive way of seeing. When we dream less and less at night, dream eyes atrophy. Hmm. That capacity 
to to see in an expanded way. So I think we're seeing in smaller and small through smaller and smaller constricted frameworks. Uh, I think that is so much reflected in what's going on culturally and politically in the world today. Uh, I was mentioning before um, we started, uh, I, I live in a, a small, uh, I'll call it a dream community uh, um, south of Tucson. I, I work, still have a home in Tucson, but I, I'm in Tubac, Arizona, which is uh, the New York Times referred to as one of the quirkiest towns in America. <laughs> um, it is an unusual little town. Um, we're a few minutes north of Mexico. We have a stable population of a thousand, hmm. and we have over a hundred art galleries, wow. which is a reflection of the energy here. But there, there's a river. And it's right outside my my front uh, window here, uh, the Santa Cruz River, which is a really interesting body of water. It runs down out of the mountains uh, east of here, the Santa Rita Mountains. The river runs down into Mexico, goes down about ten kilometers, and then turns around and comes back. And then it flows north, which is an odd thing for a river to do, but it does. And it flows through to back. There's this beautiful riparian green area. Uh, it's an oasis in the desert with, with trees and water. And it's bizarre. It is incredibly lush and beautiful. There's a lot of wildlife. And there is, for lack of, of a better term, a lot of negrito. Uh, negrito is a, a term from the, the alchemists use. Uh, it's basically, uh, it basically means shit. Hmm. Uh, in a broader sense of the word. So in addition to this, this wond wondrous fluid that flows up, uh, what comes up out of Mexico and, and just what is south of here is a lot of garbage. Huh. You find old tires, uh, plastic, uh, just all kinds of stuff. And people, you know, round up, they, they, they round it up and clean it up. Again. But it's a really beautiful um, depiction of our relationship with Mexico. So yeah. let me let me share why I'm saying all this. I spent uh, uh, many years studying with a man that I would would say is a shaman, a dream work. And um, when, whenever we came, we had a small group. When we came to him with a dream, if if the dream was situated, you know, I dreamt I was in Mexico hmm. or Guatemala or Brazil or Argentina, he would get really excited. And what he taught us over time was that that the location where the dream happens. Um, it is reflexive of its depth. So those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, which includes the US and Europe, for example, when we dream of what's down there, you know, we're scooping down really deep and bringing up psychospiritual mm. nerve. Um, the alchemists were very much into this. In fact, the word alchemy comes from the ancient name of Egypt. Uh, Egypt was known as keme. A lot of what the alchemists would do was they were connecting with the, the spiritual wisdom of Egypt, of North Africa, of what was south. Hmm. So in our world, our relationship with Latin America, with what's south of here is really critical. I really believe, I believe strongly that over the years of this gradual diminishment of dreaming, which I think goes back 50, 60, 70 years for, for reasons we can talk about, I, I think... Um, the discussion of the wall, building a wall between U.S. and Mexico, I think that is simply a late stage symptom of creating a, a physical wall. It's a symptom of this energetic wall that has been going up gradually for decades, that we are cut off, not just literally from Mexico or, or South America, but we're cut off from a certain quality of deep energy in the dream world. That's uh, that makes sense to me, man. Um, I mean, on a on a personal note, for what you said about um, psychologists today not really in um, general people not being interested in dreams. Um, when I was getting out of the military, actually, I was talking to a psychologist, um, and one of the things that I brought up was that um, one of the the reasons I wasn't feeling well is because I was no longer dreaming. And I, I said that I was sleeping well, so that wasn't the problem, but I, my dreams had gone away and that was really concerning to me. And when I told that to the psychologist, um, they responded saying, what's the big deal? What, what's the problem with that? And wow, that's yeah. And I was blown away by that. I could not believe that somebody actually, um, didn't regard dreams as being important and especially like, uh, them going away and, um, people generally say that, you know, you, you sleep less when you get older or you dream less when you get older. And I, I think that's absolutely uh, false. And I would like to hear your, um, your perception of 
as we get older, you've worked with a lot of older individuals but, in their dreams. It comes at the moment, I want to comment on what you said. When I was talking about teaching, most of my students now are physicians. They're, they're medical students, residents, postdoc fellows. Uh, I do teach psychologists. I, I, I travel and teach. But um, it, it turns out we have data now that suggests that, that psychologists are significantly less interested in dreaming. In fact, two, three weeks ago, I did a presentation at a luncheon at the Southern Arizona Psychological Association. We had 50 or 60 psychotherapists, psychologists there. And as I frequently do, I, I open with a question. You know, I said, well, how many of you actively um, use dream work in, in your psychotherapy? And I, I've asked this literally of thousands of people over the last 10, 12, 20 years. And, you know, I expect that, that roughly um, 10 to 20 percent of the hands would go up. Well. Not a single hand went up. Whoa. And um, again, there, there, there's data, there's research showing that, that my people, psychotherapists, are less and less interested in dreaming. Psychotherapy grew out of dreaming, although I'm not a Freudian per se. I think it contributed tremendously to dream work, and, and that's where psychotherapy was born. But therapists are less interested. People are less interested in dreaming. The, the po most popular dream books are kind of like parlor games. You know, they're, they're dream dictionaries that, you know, if you dream about an apple, you look it up under A, it says apple sex. <laughs> you know, if you dream about a telephone pole under T, it says telephone pole uh, phone sex. You know, I, I'm spoofing, but the, the notion that it, it's really this, this uh, um, small minded reduction of the dream, subsumption of the dream into waking life. Um, but we are, we are dreaming less and, um, uh, I've believed for the past 20, 30 years that damaged dreaming, and now we have data for this, is absolutely associated with poor mood. Um, people who are clinically depressed and, and, and uh, patients with mood disorders, anxiety disorders, typically have a, um, a pattern of sleep and dreams where there's a suggestion that they're not dreaming enough. Hmm. Um, there's a notion that depression uh, metaphorically is a loss of one's dreams. Well, um, if you look at the way most depressed people dream, their dreaming looks, the dreaming has something called a uh, reduced REM latency. So um, without going into detail, the dreaming looks like the dreams of people and, and animals in research studies who have literally had their REM sleep uh, deprived or suppressed. Mm. And so, um, yeah, the, the, there's no question in my mind. And Rosalind Cartwright is a wonderful researcher, has done work over 30 years on this. Uh, healthy dreaming, aside from whatever, whatever else it does, is a form of endogenous psychotherapy. The dream moves us toward healing. It processes negative emotion. It processes challenging experiences during the day. If we don't dream well, we are not really... Uh, digesting, nourishing experiences from waking life. Um, poor dreaming is a kind of psychological constipation in my mind. So, so let, me, let me say why I think we're dreaming poorly. There are a number of reasons. Um, one is we drink too much alcohol, and we've known this for decades. The World Health Organization is talking about it. I'm not a teetotaler. I think a drink is fine. Um, less is better with food is essential and earlier is better because alcohol absolutely interferes with REM sleep. Um, and um, at, at, at the tip of the, uh, the, the sort of clinical iceberg, there are, I forgot the exact number, but I want to say approximately 10 million Americans who drink over more, more than eight drinks, eight to 10 drinks per night, hmm. which is toxic. You know, against the tip of the iceberg, and it, it goes down from there. But but millions and millions, tens of millions of people dream uh, drink too much, meaning they're not dreaming well, even if they're not remembering whether they dream or not. Um, there's a an interesting question we don't have a complete answer to about cannabis. Uh, I I absolutely support the notion that cannabis can be useful medically and in, in other ways, even recreationally. But again, we're we're seeing. Um, particularly with, with increased uh, legalization around recreation use, uh, uncontrolled use. And there, the early evidence we have, surprising to me, is that, that cannabis is much like alcohol. It can actually help you fall asleep, but over time, it can suppress REM sleep. Mm. Um, 
Most psychiatric medications, including benzodiazepines, which are the most commonly used psych drugs in the world, significantly suppress REM sleep. Virtually every antidepressant on the market, we're talking about millions of people, mostly women who are using these, significantly suppress REM sleep. I'm not arguing against them. I do believe they're way overused and we have other alternatives, but we're suppressing REM sleep. As the population ages, um, we use drugs, we use more and more drugs that are categorized as anticholinergics. We know that acetylcholine is a, a significant, the major neurotransmitter mediating REM sleep mm -hmm. in the central nervous system. And the suppression of acetylcholine suppresses dreaming. Many, many drugs are anticholinergic and mm -hmm. suppress dream. So that's one huge category that suppresses dreaming. Another um, is sleep disorders. And um, if we have trouble staying asleep through the latter part of the night, which is the most common form of insomnia, we are not really losing sleep. We're losing dreaming. As we know that we do most of our dreaming in the latter third of the night. Uh, Shakespeare uh, touched on this when he had Hamlet say, to sleep perchance the dream, you know. And I, we, we now have really compelling evidence that um, the, the awakenings in the latter part of the night are dramatically increased by the onset of REM sleep. Mm. Psychologically, it's as if we're sleeping and we hear kind of rumbling in the horizon. The dream is coming, right? We hear, hear, hear the horse hoofs and there's a dust cloud and, and there's a part of us that wakes up because we know that that dream is, is bringing experiences mm. and emotion that might shake up the waking ego. So a lot of that, a lot of the middle of the night awakening and early morning awakening and difficulty falling back asleep is dream related. Mm -hmm. When I deal with patients like that, we focus a lot on dreaming. And unfortunately, most, most, uh, most of my colleagues don't. They look at the cognitive and behavioral aspects, which are important of sleep, but they lose the dream piece. So um, I guess the, the last part, oh, let me mention too. So, um, the other sleep disorder that dramatically damages dreaming is obsess uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Mm, yeah. um, and for lots of reasons, apnea patients often show up with uh, virtually uh, no dreaming, sometimes very little or no dreaming, because the what happens in our musculature during the dream raises the risk of an obstruction. Mm. So when they start to dream, they stop breathing, basically, and they wake up. Um, so between apnea and insomnia, we're looking at probably... 100 million Americans, you know, you add alcohol and drugs and medications into that, we're, you know, and there's overlap, of course, we're looking at millions and millions of people. Lastly, and not unimportant, <clears throat> uh, I think is our attitude toward dreaming. I think we've lost our regard for the dream. It's reflected in the fact that psychotherapists don't address it anymore or address it very little. Um, it's considered a parlor game. Now, that's not to say that there aren't po pockets of people who are interested. So I, I'm involved um, with the International Association for the Study of Dreams. It's a wonderful group. Um, a surprisingly small group, in my opinion, is maybe 3,000 members, and I'd expect there to be 300,000 members, but it is what it is. Anyhow, um, I have initiated a project. It's just now getting off the ground and uh, it is a global dream circle network initiative. The purpose of this is to create places around the world um, where people can come and safely with support and encouragement socially share their dreams. The great poet Goethe uh, wrote that you never tell your dream to anybody who doesn't have a high, high regard for it, you know? Um, let me just share an aside, which is so troubling. I had a, a series of conversations with the editor of a major psychology journal a uh, year, year and a half, two years ago now. And I've written for them before and I've presented at conferences. And, and uh, I wanted to write an article inviting psychologists back into the dream world. And uh, I, I wrote a draft and um, he kicked it back and said he wanted less of this, more of that. I gave him that. He kicked it back and said just the opposite. And I said, hey, what's going on? And he said to me, and this is a quote, he said, whenever one of my patients talks to me about a dream, I yawn. Oh, no. It was just profound. It was profound. Um, so 
my hope in this project with the ISD, International Association of Southern Dreams, is to, to see, to start creating places around the globe, uh, in towns and cities, uh, where somebody, in public spaces actually, we're talking about pe groups of people meeting in cafes, which I, I've done here for four years, uh, meeting in churches, um, me meeting in, in public places. Um, there's a sociological concept called the third place. It's an interesting thing most people don't know about. Uh, the first place is home. The second place is work. The third place is a place where you go to hang out just to be. It might be a barber shop. It might be a bar, you know, but yeah. you know, a place where you can go and just be. A fourth place is a place where you can go and be spiritually and be in the dream, not religiously, yeah. but it's a safe place to share personal spiritual experience. Not somebody talking to you about the Bible or the Koran or something, but a place where you can share internally. So my hope is that we will get a hundred of these going within the next year uh, that we will see them. And, you know, we're talking about training people or getting people who are trained. We have ethical standards about how to talk about the dream. We want a profound sense of regard and ethics. Um, you know, we're, we're not talking about um, advocating any particular form of interpretation, but really encouraging, inviting the dream back up. And so this would address the third category of dream loss, which is a loss of interest. And um, you know, and I know, and I think millions of us know that if we simply begin to pay attention to the dream, um, it starts a conversation with us. I do, I do something I call dialogic dream therapy, where I look at the dreaming as, as communication with the unconscious. It's an ongoing dialogue, a mutually respectful dialogue between who I am and this unconscious world, my unconscious, the collective unconscious. So we want to broaden that uh, on a global scale. Hmm. Well, that's great, man. Yeah. Um, whenever, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely check that out and try to start up something locally after I get trained up. That would be great and something that I'd be uh, inspired to do and probably would help oh, cool. out the community I'm yeah, in here as well. That. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I also asked about the uh, the age group, so um, and something I'm really interested in because um, I hear over and over again that the older you get, the less you dream, and I think that is most likely yeah. false. And you have a lot of experience in that. I was wondering if you could share um, some of your uh, views on that. Yeah, it's true and false. <laughs> And, you know, when we dream, those kinds of statements make sense. So here's the thing. In our world, given how we live, given the strength, given the uh, dismissal of the value of dreaming, given the toxic burdens in the environment, uh, given how little we sleep, it's true. In our world, generally speaking, people sleep and dream less as they age. But there's a critical distinction we have to make between um, a health norm and a statistical norm. Just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. And right. we make that mistake. We say, oh, yeah, this is how we do it. So this must be nature. It's not. Of course, um, we encounter people uh, all the time who are older and um, sleeping well and dreaming well. There's nothing. I don't believe there's anything inherent in age per se. In fact, I, I strongly suspect that we can open to richer and deeper dreams as we get older, mm -hmm. that the opposite might happen. And uh, the more we cultivate peace in our lives, I think the better we sleep and vice versa. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, well, that's good news for me when I get older, because <laughs> I'd like to keep dreaming. Um, and you brought up a great point about um, how to kind of waken up your dreams is um, when I got out of the military, especially I had more time to actually get restful sleep and I could pay attention to my dreams again. And they uh, started coming back to me. So um, that was a good thing for me. But um, what are I mean, you, you talked about culture or not culturally, but that we continually are kind of going in this depressant way of repressing our dreams and not paying attention to them. And do you like have any theories of why that's happening? I mean, there's got to be a reason behind it, why Western culture and even Eastern culture now is kind of going in that direction. Yeah, I, I think the short answer is is materialism. Um, and what I mean by that is there, there's a common 
very common belief um, in the academic world, in the world of science, that life itself, that consciousness is an accidental epiphenomenon of having a body and a brain. Um, this, of course, is, is, is this is the hard problem, right? Um, but there's an assumption that we um, we need to rely on a trust and trust objective data. Um, and by the way, if you talk to um, um, accomplished statisticians, you know people who do the math behind the science. So much of what goes down in the name of science um, is not is, is bullshit. Uh, I, I'm not, and I, but I, I teach in medical school. I believe in empirical evidence. Um, there, there's a place for that, but you know it's so easy to to spin numbers, and there are biases in that. Uh, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but there's a lot of bathwater. The, the other flip side of that is that we are we learn uh, not to trust ourselves. And, and we, you and I were talking about this earlier. I really believe that maybe the greatest challenge in life today, um, this goes back to actually to a question uh, that was asked of Albert Einstein. Um, a newspaper reporter asked Einstein what he believed, what Einstein believed was the single most critical question in life, thinking Einstein would say something about the speed of light or gravity. Einstein said the most important question is, is the universe friendly? Hmm. It's a profound question is, can I trust this life, despite the fact that there is so much tragedy and anxiety and horror? And I mean, terrible things happen. Can I trust the universe? Can I trust it? Um, Steven Pinker, who you might know at Harvard, has written beautifully about um, evidence-based, very positive trends around the world, dramatic reductions in violence, war, poverty. Uh, it's really interesting to look at that. So that's an argument for trust. Um, but we look around, we look at our own lives, we look at people we love who are sick, uh, we look at what's going on politically, we look at wars around the world. Um, it's not always a very pretty place. The reason I bring this up though, is the corollary is the universe friendly is, am I friendly? Can I trust my unconscious? Mm. So if we go back historically, the answer is absolutely not. Um, you know, the belief has been for, for centuries, let's say for example, from a Christian perspective, that, that children are born with uh, vulnerability to demonic influence. Mm. There was a law on the books in Connecticut until 1972, they just forgot to remove it, that made it legal for a father to accidentally kill his son if he was trying to beat the devil out of him. Whoa. It commonly understood that there, there was demonic influence. Freud picked up on this, I think, half consciously. And you know, what, what was called the demonic Freud called, and actually the original term Freud used was in German, das S, which means the it. Hmm. We know it as the id. Freud believed that what was deepest inside of us was this um, repugnant, reposit or repository of repugnant impulses, you know, wanting to do terrible sexual things to your father or mother or kill people. This is hor horrible demonic thing. And that that had to be uh, somehow transformed and redirected by the ego and the superego. But from Freud's, per, Freud's perspective, the unconscious could not be trusted. We had to sit on it. And um, of course, some of this shows up in our dreaming. Mm -hmm. You know, we have nightmares where, or we have hypnagogic hallucinations where, where these demonic images appear and things challenge us or they come up inside of us, you know. So can we trust? Can we trust the unconscious is the question. And I think that I, I think the unspoken, unexamined, unconscious answer is no. We don't trust the unconscious in ourselves. We don't trust the unconscious in others. You know, it's like, hey, I know why I, I, I know why they did that. They're going to deny it. Even if they're a good person, they have an unconscious. They have unresolved childhood issues, you know, and, and they're going to end up betraying us and not following through. <sighs> That's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so if you can't trust the unconscious, then how do you how do you deal with that? I guess how do you work through that? Trust, in my opinion, is not a feeling; it's a it's a behavior. So I, I even if I'm <clears throat> ambivalent, concerned, frightened, um, 
at the risk of being naive, uh, uh, at the cause of being innocent, I can act trustfully. I can act trustfully. I had some dental work done yesterday, nothing major, but I don't particularly like the dentist. I had some weird experiences as a kid. And <laughs> never been important enough to deal with in therapy, but, but um, of course, when I'm going to go to the dentist, uh, some, I notice some fear coming up. And, uh, but I go, because I, I trust, I trust this guy a lot. <clears throat> trust is an act. Uh, so we can, even if we are frightened by our dreams or by nightmares or by hypnagogic hallucinations, as they're called, I don't like that term. We can choose to step into that. It's an act of courage. We can choose to open to a dialogue, a, an ongoing conversation with the unconscious. And I think people who do, um, they're, they're often called, called by a very strange name in our world. They're called artists. Mm. Uh, could because they they it's such a compelling conversation when you open a dialogue with that world, it changes your conversation with the inner world and the outer world and of course there are these mirrored reflections back and forth. Um, so I think it's a practice. I think it's a willingness. We cultivate trust by, or we, we cultivate a belief in the unconscious by acting trustfully. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, so with, with improving our ability to dream so i mean from my understanding we kind of dream every night so um what you're kind of describing is that um we're we're practicing a way to remember our dreams maybe so that we can actually um use that information and, and apply it to our waking life is that kind of what you're talking about yeah, yeah, in both directions, we can apply apply our experience of the dream and understanding to our waking life, and we can uh, apply our waking lives to understand our dreams. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So what would be um, something that people can do in order to start um, overcoming this oppression of their dreams and their REM oppression, obviously, like, you know, not drinking and um, being overweight and things like that, but more of the psychological things that they can do in order to start moving in the correct direction that you would prescribe? I, I think a number of things. That's a great question. Thank you. So one is to, to, to join a dream group or organize a dream group. If it doesn't exist. I think to create a, 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 a social structure where there, there's regard, respect, valuation of the dream is really important. A place where you can bring the dream. Otherwise, uh, you wake up in the morning, your alarm goes off. By the way, al alarm clocks have killed billions of dreams. <laughs> yeah. So if you're sitting in a movie theater, you're watching a great film, and, it, and it's winding down, you know, it's culminating, it's so interesting. It's the last five minutes, and suddenly the lights go on in the theater, the projector goes off, and they usher you out. That's what the alarm clock does to a dream. <laughs> it just cuts off the end of it. Um, so... And people ask me all the time, well, how do I wake up without an alarm clock? And there's a very high tech approach to this. It's called go to bed earlier. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's simple. And, and this raises questions about trusting the unconscious. You know, uh, am I going to stay up later? Am I going to steal time? Am I, I going to watch the late show or whatever people do at night? Um, rather than really enjoying, and I, I've written about falling in love with sleep and dreams. Um, which means going to bed is as interesting as waking up in the morning, if not more. So you, you open to that. But then the other side of it is you, you awaken gradually. What we call grogginess um, is actually a fascinating hybrid state of consciousness. Mm. Uh, groggy comes from the English rum drink grog. Mm. And the word groggy means that we awaken drunk, which is so, such an interesting spin. <laughs> we're drunk, then we just want to dismiss it. And we do that. We wake up, you know, take a shower, drink some coffee, get out of your drunken stupor. Um, it, it, it's so distorted because grogginess is actually, um, it's a braid. It's a mix of sleep, dreams, and waking. They're woven together. And um, the best way to remember dreams is, is to awaken slowly. Um, most of us, as we're waking up, we will shift in our chair. I'm sorry, we will shift in our beds. And um, it's helpful to just go back to the last position you were sleeping in 
keep your eyes closed, ask your bladder to please be patient for a minute or two, which it can. And then here's the hard part, do nothing. So dr dreams live in, in the feminine, they live in yin, they live in a, in a world with less intention. You go chasing the dream with a butterfly net and it's gonna run from you. And so the dream is actually right there. And if you go looking for it, it's a little like, like looking for the pizza guy, the pizza delivery guy, you stay <laughs> home, he'll show up, right? You look for him, he's gonna come and you're gonna be gone. So, so you linger in bed. And the do nothing part is hard for us because it's part of part of trust in the unconscious is coming to recognize that it has its own volition, it has its own will. And so, in a dialogue, we speak and we listen. So this is listening. And the next step then is is uh, you there'll be an image even in people for people who haven't dreamt in a long time. Uh, I saw a tree. There was a dog. You know, there was a, a, a vague sense of my mother. Um, whatever comes, even if it's just a snippet, the practice then is to bridge it to the waking world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Write it down. Um, I record my dreams vocally in, in my smartphone. Excuse me. That's a great idea. <clears throat> Dog alarm, huh? So interesting. I don't know if you can read this, but my phone says scam likely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's my first one. <clears throat> You know, it's so interesting how much we trust the waking world, isn't it? You get these weird emails telling you, I got one today that, that uh, I've inherited $31 oh, million. Wow. You're rich. I'm rich and people <laughs> off, uncles offering me loans for 0%, you know, at 60 years. Anyhow, um, so we want to bridge the dream to the waking world. And we can write, do by writing it down. If, if our partner, if we have a bed partner and they're receptive, it's a beautiful thing to share the dream. The, the ultimate purpose in sharing is not interpretation. Mm. <clears throat> if you take a wonderful trip, let's say you go to India for three weeks and come back, you don't, you don't have a slideshow and share it with your friends for them to interpret your trip. Right? It's like the, the experience is the experience. I'm not arguing against interpretation, but I think it's just really important to be with it. And, and when partners share, it opens a channel for intimacy that's really profound. You get to know one another from the inside out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. That's a really great idea, man, um, about your idea about creating the, the community that can actually um, share their dreams without like judgment and things like that. It sounds like kind of like an AA meeting, but for dreams and the therapy yeah, exactly. kind of comes out of that. I like, I like that. It's a support group. Uh, there's a regard for um, the autonomy of the individual, you know, for every dream. You know, one of the techniques you might be familiar with in our dream circles, when someone has a dream and we want to comment, we say something like, you know, when I had that dream, we, we actually share it, but we take mm. it in as ours. And there's no imposition. Uh, it, it, we're not imposing our view on another. We're just sharing one perspective. Oh, yeah. uh, and it's similar to life. You know, you can take 10 people in the same place and they all have um, their own personal experience of it. Yeah. So yeah, then finding dream circles, I think, I think is really crucial. Neat. Um, so I had some questions about um, sleep disorders and one that I guess is not really a disorder, but should be probably categorized as, as sleep paralysis. Um, a lot of doctors don't really understand what it is they um they don't have any way to assist these people um but it, there's literally you know probably a hundred thousand people at least um that have these experiences probably millions mm -hmm. actually um and i'm trying to i run like a facebook group that assists people and kind of dealing with the experience not trying to cure them or anything like that but um what are i'm having troubles um, conveying the message to them to do certain things in order to help them. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. from an expert's point of view yourself, what are some things that these people can do and actually assist them to um, maybe overcome the experience or to live with the experience or, you know, what, what is that? So, so yeah, that, that's such an important question too. I, I let me just start by saying I, I've had sleep paralysis and, and, uh, in fact, uh, my first sleep paralysis was in graduate school years ago. Uh, it freaked me out. I thought I'd had a stroke, you know, when I was a kid. Um, 
I got up and started reading about it. And back then, there was virtually nothing known. And I, uh, I diagnosed myself as the first of many misdiagnoses uh, as having narcolepsy. <laughs> because it is a common symptom of narcolepsy, although most people who have it do not have narcolepsy. And so it, it's helpful to remember, number one, that as frightening as it might be, it's perfectly safe. Really critical for people to know that they are perfectly safe. And that, that may take some doing. So some people realize they can't move. Uh, they try to take a breath, they can't breathe because their breathing is not under voluntary control. But, so it's important to know that all of your essential functions <clears throat> are under automatic or autonomic control. Your heart is beating, your body is breathing itself. Um, typically, um, we are not processing sensory information. You know, we might have, we, we, we usually have a sense we're in bed, but our eyes are closed usually. We, um, we are having sleep paralysis is an out-of-body experience. Um, there's really very little sensory information coming in. And because we're experiencing the muscular paralysis, our voluntary muscles are offline, there's nothing going out. So we're not, consciousness is not in the body. This is true of, of dreaming too, which is an amazing fact that's overlooked. I, I think whatever we want to call it, the self, the soul, the spirit, I think it gets really cramped when it's cooped up inside of a body for 24 seven. It's like wearing tight shoes, right? Yeah. You, know, you know that feeling when you, you take off a tight shoe, it's like your foot goes, yeah. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think it's not a body experience. So there's a, there's a way of putting a positive spin on it, but we have to begin with knowing that we're safe. That consciousness is no longer totally confi confined to the body, we're safe. And we're kind of in a dream state um, with or without dream experiences. Now, my take on what goes on in a lot of hypnagogic hallucination, um, we tend to think of the, the, the waking world and the sleeping dreaming world as being these two separate contiguous worlds. So I'm in one, I'm in sleeping or dreams, and then I go through the door and I'm in waking. But actually, in sleep paralysis, we're right here. We're in a place where both worlds are present. Hmm. And I think it's actually, in my understanding, is that it is reality i think that's that's the real world i think we tend to to um sort of break apart psychologically break apart the dream world and the waking world and when they come together which they do in say certain psychedelic experiences or, or other other life experiences um it it can be profound so um the um we, we often refer to the dreaming that that's associated with with that uh, as a big dream Big dreams, by definitions, are dreams that you will never forget. They often have a this hypno, hypnagogic hallucinatory quality, but um, it, it's um, as my my friends with narcolepsy say, it's realer than real. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and I've had them. Um, I've just had a few, but you know, you you just don't forget them. So, given that, given number one, it's safe, and number two. We are, for whatever reason, peering into the world behind the world, a larger reality. Uh, um, sometimes it's associated with beautiful imagery. There's a woman who talks about the room. She's trying to wake her husband up because the room is filled up with these luminescent butterflies. And it's oh, wow. beautiful, beyond belief, like these angels. And, of course, sometimes it's associated with horror, mm. you know, with, with um, these classic stories of, of an incubus or succubus trying to kill or rape or choke or uh, can be very frightening. Um, so number one, the harder you try to get out of sleep paralysis, the more you will be stuck. Uh, do you, you know those Chinese finger puzzles? <laughs> <laughs> like a tube, and you put yeah. your fingers in, the tighter you pull, <clears throat> the more they constrict. The reason for that is uh, REM sleep is driven in large part by emotion. And so if you're conjuring a lot of intention, uh, intense emotion to try to get out, it's going to keep propagating REM qualities and keep you stuck the harder you try. So the first thing, in the, and that is to relax, you know, you relax your fingers, you kind of gently twist and gently pull out. So let go into the experience. Know that you're safe. Don't fight it. The fighting keeps us stuck in there. Know that you're safe. Don't fight it. 
and uh, and trust it, and we'll pull you out. But but let me just say a word about about the dark side of this, which I've dealt with with a lot of patients over time, and and um, it's profound. Um, we're, we're actually talking broadly about nightmares, and um, it's a huge issue in life today. I mean, we have tens of thousands of wounded warriors coming back from war fronts with post-traumatic nightmares in tow. And uh, in our world, the nightmare is seen as a path as pathology. It's a symptom of a disease. It's a mm -hmm. symptom of PTSD. A lot of military folk I've worked with uh, learned very early on that they protect one another. You don't, you don't tell you know, the upper people that you've had a nightmare or that you're walking in your sleep, you get booted out or, yeah. you know, or but, but these, these soldiers, these wounded warriors, um, almost all of them are given a drug called Prezosin. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, um, it's a blood pressure heart drug and it totally blocks REM sleep. Again, the picture here is that the nightmare is a symptom of pathology. It's a symptom of disease. Everything I've learned and experienced is exactly the opposite of that, that nightmares and dreams are actually healing processes. Here's the metaphor. Uh, you get sick and you get a fever and we go to the doctor and we say we have a fever and they give you medication to take the fever down. Well, the fever is actually not a direct sign of illness. It's a sign of healing. It's endogenous healing. If we can look at the nightmare that way, and we can look at the dreams that way, we have a whole different attitude. And we have a long history and literature and experience, clinical experience, uh, that talks about a whole different way of relating to whether it's a hypnagogic hallucination or a nightmare, and that's to enter a dialogue with it. Mm. And I've, had, I've seen beautiful experiences with patients when they start to talk. One woman was haunted by this, this incubus for years, scared the hell out of her. She'd be in sleep paralysis sometimes for two hours every morning. Whoa. And I was so afraid, couldn't speak to her, look at and just, you know, kind of shiver in fear. We start talking about her, we encourage her to talk to it. Unbelievable. In a matter of a couple of days, the thing disappeared. It's been gone for three, four years now. Wow. So sometimes they disappear. Sometimes, as you know, they transform into beautiful images. But but this is this is an act of courage. It's an act of trust. <clears throat> so you 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 step into a dialogue. The one thing about dreaming, which I think is lovely, is um, despite despite old wives' tales, you can't really be harmed in a dream. You know, there's a, there's a very common belief. Maybe you know that if you die in a dream, you're dead. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that one. A lot of people believe if you die in a dream. Have you died in a dream? Oh yes, many times. Uh, me too. In fact, I say to people, if you ever have an opportunity to die in a dream, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's yeah. very interesting. It makes you, uh, it makes you understand. I think for me, whenever I die in the dream and I, I, I wake up, um, usually like, um, the dream continues on after I die as well. So I, I get reborn or something like that. Yes. It makes me, yeah. um, uh, have a sense of dealing with death and, and, and life and, and the process that it, that it's a normal process and it's okay to happen. Um, so obviously I, I think that's where you're going with it, but yeah, you know, I, I had this dream some years ago where I was in a small plane with some friends and we crashed. We crashed into the entry to uh, the Four Seasons in Santa Monica. It's a nice hotel. <laughs> and and we died, you know, we just fucking crashed. And, and then, you know, there's all this debris and we get up and we're brushing all this dust and metal off of us. And, and uh, somebody says, hey, man, we're dead. And some say, yeah, yeah, I know. I said, well, okay, what do you want to do? <laughs> like, okay, we're dead now. Or what do you want to do? So is that interesting? Uh, this continuity, but but it's I think at the risk of sounding too glib about it, it's hard work and and, and it takes practice and having group support, um, you know, sharing a dream world, not just not just having my own dreams, but sharing the dream world. In our world today, we look at the dream. Freud, for example, looked at the dream as a reflection that you would see in a funhouse mirror, you know, those mirrors that are wobbly. And basically you'd see yourself and you'd get distorted. And so he believed you had to, you had to kind of uh, 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 interpret, uh, recode the dream so you could see yourself as you were. Well, that funhouse mirror, I think that mirror is actually a door. Hmm. It's, 
you can actually go through the looking glass. You'll see, you know, if you're standing in front of a glass door at night and it's dark behind, you'll see a reflection of yourself. It will mirror yourself. Yeah. And it's easy to forget that it's a door. So, yes, you do get a reflection of daily life, but you can go through the looking glass. That takes us into the social dream. Hmm. That takes us into a place of a shared dream. And I think we need to be there a lot more. Um, for example, these soldiers coming back with PTSD nightmares, those bad dreams are much too big for any one individual. In fact, those dreams belong to the community. They, they, they're, they're my dream and yours. They're all of our dreams. And we need to be present. And, and other soldiers need to be present. And there's, there, we have good evidence when we address it in a group, when there's support, when people share and partake of the dream, it lightens the load and helps the individual not bounce out of the dream from terror every night, helps them to get back to sleep. We, we can bring waking world group support and encouragement and mutual dreaming into healing those bad dreams. Wow. That's, that's a great idea, man. Um, I never really thought of it that way. That's the responsibility of the community as well for some of these problems that uh, veterans come back with because we kind of, uh, you know, we kind of promote that through, um, you know, democracy or whatever we want to call it. You know, we promote these people go over to other countries and have horrific experiences. And so in a way, you know, like uh, a lot of people um, support veterans and things like that, but this would be another way for people to do that that I think actually would help them versus just giving them money or food or something like that, you know? Let's join with them into that dream space. Plus it's very personal too. And very interesting, man. Um, So another aspect of dreams is like lucid dreaming and you mentioned out-of-body experiences and I wanted to hear your take on um, those experiences and how they can be used for healing and kind of your perspective of what is happening in these experiences. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure many listeners know that lucidity uh, has two separate dimensions. Uh, one is awareness of the dream. And, and that can be cultivated. Um, in fact, we can cultivate awareness of sleep, even though sleep scientists tell us it's impossible to be aware, be aware of sleep. We have really good data now from studies in, in yoga nidra and mindfulness that you can actually cultivate awareness of sleep. You can you can be be present, co-conscious. So many people will have spontaneous lucid experiences. They're dreaming, and uh, they're where they're dreaming. In fact, um, often when we're we're transitioning from the dream back in, into waking, um, say for example, somebody's having a bad dream. Not necessarily a nightmare. By definition, a nightmare is so bad it pops you out of the, the hmm. dream okay uh, but a bad dream you know we're having a bad dream and then suddenly there's a sense of being in bed you feel the sheets the smell of the bed the person um and you get this wave of relief like oh wow i'm asleep oh that's just the dream but the dream is still kind of there you know that one so that's a kind of lucidity <clears throat> i refer to this as something i call the verge because you're on the verge of waking. And at that point, if you want, you can you can just hoist yourself back into the waking world, right? Mm, yeah. Or you can stay you can stay in dream. So a lot of people will choose to stay in dream because knowing that it's a dream means that they will they no matter how bad it gets, that they're gonna wake up. This is a is a really interesting spiritual notion. Um, around a, a, a universal spiritual concept that life itself, that this is a dream. If this is a dream too, there's a dream within a dream. If this is a dream, we're gonna wake up from it one day. But the more we can cultivate a sense of living in the dream, the more comfort we have that we'll wake up. Hmm. So there, there's that verge lucidity. I, I like that because um, it doesn't necessarily involve the second part of lucidity, which I think can be overdone. It needs to be practiced with um, with care, with intelligence. So uh, a lot of people will cultivate um, lucid ability and um, spend their time, you know, dreaming and uh, doing whatever the hell they want, you know? <laughs> yeah. you know? Great sex life and you can eat whatever you want and fly and, you know, um, as in the movie Inception, you can fucking kill a lot of people. And it's just really cool. You know, it's like living in a video game, right? Right, yeah. Uh, 
So in Tibetan Buddhism, there is a there is a spiritual path that it's often referred to as their most arduous spiritual path called sleep and dream yoga. <clears throat> and over a period of years and decades, they teach the practitioners, these monks, one of the things they teach them is to, to be lucid. But they strongly, they encourage awareness of dreaming while we're dreaming, but they strongly discourage tampering with the dream. Hmm. This is a controversial issue. Um, um, they believe that the more that we tamper with it, the more that we're dominating the conversation, the, the dream's part of the conversation. It's just me telling the dream what to do, right? And the dream will, will to some degree, comply with that. So um, that's a personal, I think, spiritual question that people need to address. Um, <clears throat> I, I obviously lean toward a dialogic view. This is not to say that we don't ever change things. I, I think um, the dialogue, the conversation in dream requires lucidity. I can be in the dream, and if I'm faced with something frightening, monstrous, challenging, if it's in my face, I can turn to it, and with lucidity, I can decide not to run. I can decide to say, hey, who are you? <clears throat> Why are you here? You know, you know, do you need something from me? Are you trying to teach me something? I can stay present in the dialogue. You know, essentially, a, a dear friend, a teacher of mine was a, a Christian minister, and he, uh, he taught me that in the, in the New Testament, there are three places where Jesus, you might, may know more about this than I do, Jesus confronts demons. Um, and he says, in every case, you'd think Jesus would say, hey, in the name of the Father, be gone. Yeah. He doesn't. He pretty much says, sit down, tell me your story. He enters into a dialogue hmm. with what appears to be frightening and evil, and they disappear. Yeah. So it's an old biblical uh, approach, probably a, a universal spiritual approach to, to have a courageous dialogue with the things that frighten us. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that resonates with me, especially um, where I had some sleep paralysis uh, events taking place with hypnagogic visuals and um, decided to have a dialogue with those beings. And, and it turned out that uh, they were actually reflections of myself and they evaporated after that. So it, um, what you said sounds very true to my personal life and experience with, with dreams. So, I mean, um, you know, one aspect of lucid dreaming, like you said, was the control aspect where you're, you think you're in control and, uh, you're doing things in this dream. And it seems to me that they start fighting back eventually, um, through my personal experience, the, the dream starts fighting back and taking more control over you. And it, can get a lot more <laughs> negative um but once a person starts listening to the dream dialogue itself or listening to it and having that experience um i've i've tend to see people going into like what would be considered like shamanistic journeys and um heroes journeys you know talking about joseph campbell uh, i'm not sure if you've had any um experiences with that i'm sure you have though but um could you speak on that on shamanic journeys through dreams yeah like um the hero's journey through dreams or the shamanic journey through dreams if you've you personally have taken these uh journeys or had these experiences in dreams where they continually grow and change and they're trying to communicate some type of dialogue to you or your patients yeah you know just going back generally i i really i think uh, whether we are aware of it or not or consider it or not, I think we are all on a hero's journey. And what Campbell reminded us is, is that we, we, can be, we can be cognizant of that journey. Whether we're aware of it or not, we're all, we're all on a journey. You know? uh, it's comforting to know and it's comforting, I think, again, it brings us to the question, can I trust life? Can I, can I trust the universe? Um, do, do you know Bruce Coburn's music? No. Who's I'm really bad music? with names. I, if I heard his music, I'd probably, I'd be like, yeah, I know that. He's done some, I think, some very beautiful, poetic, spiritual work. Uh, lost songs by dreaming. Um, he had a, his, his only hit was years ago, 19, early 70s. Um, and um, I think it was called um, The Lions. And the, the, the song was, I had another dream about the lions at the door. They weren't half as frightening as they were before. And I'm thinking about eternity, some kind of ecstasy got a hold on me. 
and I'm wondering where the lines are. Anyhow, that's that song has been in my psyche for decades. Mm. I, the reason I share that is, um, without going into a lot of detail about my life, I had a dream this morning where um, uh, I was in the new home of, of some friends and um, about to step into the backyard and there were a bunch of lions there. There were lions right at the door. And um, um, there was actually a lioness, hmm. a big lioness and her cubs. And no one else seemed to be concerned. And I, I said, oh, I mean, there's a lion back, lion at the door. And um, I, I gathered a bunch of people and, and got us into like a, a closet or I don't know, locked the door and I went to call for help. And I realized I couldn't find my cell phone. And so we came out of the room and then the lions had migrated to the front door. They were at both doors. And um, I realized my cell phone was in my back pocket and I really didn't want to call for help. And then the, the lion was around the door and actually came in. And uh, they weren't half as frightening as they were before. <laughs> so I, and without going into detail, for me, the lion is, is really a very potent expression of the feminine, mm -hmm. really potent. And there's an unpredictability to it. Um, and in both, I'll just say generally in my life today, there's some issues around that. And in, in our life, uh, this whole issue of the power of the feminine is up. Uh, we see it politically today as there's a, a somebody being considered for the Supreme Court who is being challenged by the feminine, challenged as a man who actually, uh, the challenges that he disregarded or disrespected, uh, or intruded upon, abused the feminine, um, which is, um, uh, you know, symptomatic of the, the old patriarchy as we've known it. So for me, this dream um, both at the same time speaks to some very personal issues hmm. in my relationship to the feminine, to a woman, and also to, um, to a larger issue. And I find that's the case in the journey. The journey, you know, um, as I would say, you know, um, live locally, dream globally, right? Uh, the dream, the dream is a, a spiritual GPS system that locates us. And I think almost always, it's not always, but almost always, it reverberates out into the larger world. And that's, that's the shamanic view. Um, and, and I think it's a comforting view. Jung taught us, and I, I firmly believe that we can never fully interpret a dream any more than we can fully interpret anything because it's in flux and, and it is a part of something larger. But we can tap into it and we can join that flux. It's an act of faith. It's an act of trust that there's something intelligent um, uh, going on around us. There's something larger. It's something we can trust. So um, I think modern shamanism is merging with a lot of what we, we are learning in psychology, the best of psychology today. Uh, I'm not talking about hard-ass research, but just about what we learn about how, how to manage life and how to manage feelings. But I do think it's easier when we consciously live. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, Billy Joel called it the river of dreams, um, when we consciously live in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have to talk about the negative side, too, of dreams and, and sleep. And one of the questions I had was, can we dream too much or can we sleep too much? Does that have any effect on our lives and and if so how yeah um i don't think so i i think that um there are again okay, so we my people in psychology believe for forever that um, one of the classic symptoms of depression is oversleeping it turns out when we interview depressed patients and they say they're sleeping they're not they're just lingering in bed you know they're they're kind of they, they just want to get the hell out of bed you know given their lives or who, who can blame them. It's, like, it's not sleep. It, it turns out depressed people sleep a little bit more insignificantly than other people. They're more fatigued, but mm. they, they're not more sleepy. Um, I, I don't think we can sleep more. It's not like eating where you can keep doing it. it when, when your system is finished sleeping, unless there's an illness or something that's pulling you into it, you, you, will, you will awaken. I think it's the case for dreaming too, but there's a common belief in modern psychiatry and certain branches of it, that um, excessive dreaming is a cause of anxiety and depression. And it's one of the reasons we they bless these medications that suppress dreaming. They believe we need to suppress dreaming. Um, 
if you have a, a hose, you, a water hose, and you're running water through, and you put a nozzle on it, and you tighten that nozzle, um, you're going to get less water going through it under greater pressure. Mm, yeah. When dreaming is suppressed, either by medication or through uh, limited sleep or other channels, sometimes the dreaming will show up much more intensely. But that's because it's being forced through a much smaller opening. Okay, it's like, and so people will often report the dreaming too much. And I hear this a lot. Um, I, dr I dreamt all night. There's something we call alpha dreaming. Alpha dreaming is, you know, you're doing the dishes and then you then 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 you're doing the dishes and then then you're doing the dishes and then you're doing the dishes. <laughs> it's like it's, it's 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 boring, it's repetitive, but you can't stop. It's like low flying dreams. Or so sometimes you get these treetop dreams. Um, they they don't actually ascend to um, a, a, a more valuable altitude or perspective. So no, I don't believe we can. I think if dreaming is distorted, if it's unhealthy, if it's repressed. Uh, or sleeping is so um, we'll, we'll, we'll sleep uh, we'll sleep so so obstructive sleep apnea patients can sleep 10 12 hours a night and get up and they're tired well the thing is it's really poor quality sleep um, we in the western world today we're way overfed we eat so many more calories than we need but they're empty calories right so we overeat but we're undernourished um, I don't think we can oversleep and overdream. I think if we're doing it in a healthy way, hmm. I'm... that makes sense, man. Well, you've had some really amazing analogies, and those are really good things that I'm going to use eventually. And uh, when I teach people these things, you know, like the the fire hose, that's a that's a good one. And what you're kind of referring to, I think, is like re uh, rebound there, where yes, yeah. And I mean, yeah. um, off medications, they'll off, or in fact, people start on an SSRI and antidepressant. They report increased dreaming. They're actually dreaming less, mm -hmm. but the dreaming is now the nozzle is tight and it's hitting the screen of awareness with more force, so they're aware of it. So you kind of um, are going to dream regardless if you try to repress it or not. You're just going to dream in a different way. You will, but the dream might come up, it might come out under great force. It might be more nightmarish. It mm -hmm. might be limited. There's also oh, we we also know that there's there are different kinds of dreaming, which is really important. You know, there's there's a sleep onset hypnagogic dream. When we first fall asleep, there's a very, very common dream of falling. Um, there, there there's this hypnagogic experience is kaleidoscopic. You know, you get these images coming and going. <laughs> By the way, I don't forget. Um, you might know the name uh, Jennifer. Dumper, D-U-M-P-E-R-T. Do you know Jen? No. <laughs> I'm horrible with names, man. Okay. I think you ought to get to know her. So Jen is a dear friend and an incredible uh, dream person. She she has a new book. It's just She just finished writing it. It'll come out in November. It's called Liminal Dreaming. Mm -hmm. And it's it's, a, it's an essential, beautiful book. I've, I've gotten to see little parts of it here and there. And it talks about I'll tell you why I think it's important, but it talks about the dreaming that occurs when we're falling asleep, mm. the dreaming that occurs when we wake up, you get up in the middle of the night to pee and you come out of the dream and say, you know, all these different spots of dreaming around napping. And, and um, it's so important that we realize dreaming is not just REM sleep. There's, there's been strong evidence forever that there are different kinds of dreams that occur in non-REM sleep. Uh, I, you know, Jung talked about it and I do a lot of work in uh, what we call the waking dream. It's using your dream eyes while you're awake. As we talk about it, there's a dream quality to our discussion. So there's dreaminess there. And uh, the reason that's important is that we tend to segregate waking and dreaming, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. You got your waking, and here's your dreaming, and here's your sleeping. And um, what I'm writing about now, I call the United States of Consciousness. Mm. And uh, um, it's, not a, it's not the creation of a union. It's the recognition of it. It's the recognition of the continuity so when I, I go down to Mexico, I usually park on this side. I walk across the border, and I'm always uh, I'm moved by the fact that really, in a matter of a few steps, I come out of one world into another. But I, I I look at the ground and I look at the trees and the sky, and I realize it's the same piece of land, mm, yeah. you know. Um, and there's a continuity. It, there's the same ground beneath waking and sleeping and dreaming. And um, when we pay attention, we begin to get, um, we begin to get that, we begin to get that. So 
um, I started talking about the sleep onset dream and I veered off into Jen's work. Um, oh, I, I don't really remember the question. <laughs> I think it was dealing with the uh, uh, rim rebound and um, suppression of that and different kinds of dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's interesting. Re rim rebound, the loss of dreaming came up uh, with Will DeMent in 1967. He wrote a paper about this. And it's like, look, you know, they began to study the impact of loss of dreaming. And it quickly was dismissed, um, partly because there was a discovery that we dreamed in other stages of sleep. Mm -hmm. But it turns out, and Rosalind, Rosalind Cartwright has, has looked at this, there's different kinds of dreams at different points of the night. And uh, early dreaming is really good. There's little bits of dream we have interspersed in, in deep sleep in the first time. It's a very different kind of dreaming. It's non-REM dreaming. And even the REM dreaming is different than the epic dreams we get in the latter part of the night. Hmm. That makes sense, man. Yeah, I mean, I've been yeah trying to understand uh, the different areas of dreams as well because I've um, logged my dreams and then been able to see when I'm in REM and then not in REM. And I just definitely have dreams outside of REM. So that and they're definitely different quality and uh, context in there. So it's it's always interesting. Yeah. Dreams are dreams are really. Uh, you know, it surprised me every, every time I have them, even though I, I think, well, that was the, that was the end of it. You know, that was the most insane I will ever have, you know, but then it, it just keeps blowing me away each time. So they, they want to speak to us. I mean, at the risk of personifying the unconscious or the collective unconscious, the, it's a spiritual world, it's, meaning it's non-material, however else we see that. But there's a world behind the world. There, there's a sense of order and life and intention. And some people might say it's meaningless and, and uh, it's just uh, the shenanigans of, of um, uh, non-material aspects, energetic aspects of the world. But I think if we open a dialogue with it, um, we, we get sooner or later that, that there is an intelligence uh, in that world and we, we can cultivate trust for it. Definitely, man. Um, so uh, we're getting, you know, we've been talking for a while, so I want to make sure to, um, have our listeners know ways they can find your work, uh, your research and reach out to you if they have additional questions. Sure. The easiest way to contact me is through my website, which is Dr. Nyman, D-R-N-A-I-M-A-N.com. Uh, I'm, I'm easy to find with a, a web search with Google. If you Google my first name, Rubin, R-U-B-I-N, R-U-B-I-N, and the word sleep, um, it, you'll, you'll find me. Awesome. Great. And uh, I, have, I no longer do what I've written extensively for HuffPost, and I've worked with uh, Ariana Huffington. And um, so I have a lot of um, articles available on the web. Unfortunately, my dreamless article is a, it's a technical article. It's behind the paywall. Oh, okay. Uh, but they're, they're, it's been written about all, all around the globe, and there are lots of good summaries of it. Um, but yeah, I, ha I have dozens and dozens of articles on sleep and dreams. Um, most of them linked on my website, many of them on HuffPost, some on Psych Today, um, and in, in lots of places, and lots of podcasts and interviews. And I can also be uh, caught up with in the dream world. <laughs> okay. If anybody, particularly if you have, have some, some background in this area, if anybody is interested, in um, working, you know, locally on on this initiative to create yeah. dreams, so love to hear from them. Again, we're just getting off the ground, but we we really need hundreds of people. Okay, great. Um, is there a website for that yet, or, or is it the only it's way you go to? Okay, it's actually just now, um, as we speak, um, being being um, addressed um, by the executive committee. Oh, neat. So there've been conversations for months, but. Uh, it, it will happen. Uh, I know it will happen one way or another. So okay. no, they can contact me directly. And if anybody's willing, this is a nonprofit, by the way. But this is a profit loss <laughs> process. If anybody's willing to donate a website or, or donate services for that, that would be wonderful. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'll make sure that uh, once you guys get to the point that you release the information, I'll I'll promote it through the website as well and share it with everybody that I I have and. Maybe we can do another yeah. podcast then and get people to recognize the importance of we can talk about that work. about the details of how to run a dream circle. Great. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, um, Dr. Nyman, it's been great to uh, have you on the show with me and spending the time with me to talk about your dreams and your 
um, expertise in dream research. So I really appreciate uh, you spending the time to do that and share it with the you know the listeners. Likewise, I, I'm I'm glad you're out there doing this. I think it's it's really important work. Right, so man. thank you. Yeah. This has been another episode of Cosmic Echo. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about Ruben Nyman and his work, you can visit our website at tailleaders.com backslash CE podcast. And there you can click on links that will take you to his books as well as his work. Additionally, you can support this podcast by clicking our donation page located at the same website. We look forward to bringing you additional episodes in the near future, but until then, happy dreaming.